Well, when I was in the Northern Territory, I'd only been a social worker for about a year. Like, I sort of thought I was going to be allocated kids that were in placements, like, check if they were OK. That's Natalie, speaking of the time she was a fresh-faced social worker in the Northern Territory. Well, I walked in and they said, uh, nah, I think you're going to be better off in the investigations team, and here's 107 investigations that we've received, and I need you to prioritise those and identify children that might be a risk of death, like, like, go and see them. One case Natalie was involved with concerned two children, one aged three, the other 12 months. They were taken into care, but then they were returned home. Far too early. Well, we hadn't been able to put appropriate support in place, and then, like, within a few months, we were flying these children back. One with a cracked skull, and one like, with a broken arm. Particularly, the older child was showing a lot of sexualised behaviour, which was inappropriate. We knew that stuff had happened to them and we'd sent them back and subjected them to further harm. Not long after she began, Natalie left the profession. Like, I'm sure that there are probably decisions that I made that were not correct. Children left in situations that probably shouldn't have been and children who were removed that shouldn't have been. Children removed from their parents when they shouldn't have been. Meet Diane, a mother in Adelaide. Her baby was removed at birth. Everyone was upset. The nurses, even the doctor, was crying. Living interstate at the time, she wasn't a stranger to the system, as a child or a parent. They just kick you and kick you and kick you until you feel like you can't get back up anymore. And it's your job to continuously get back up. Two years after baby Jay was removed, a children's court judge said he wasn't satisfied there was evidence Diane wasn't capable of providing adequate care for her son. But because Jay had already bonded with his foster parents, the judge ordered Diane start with increased visitation then regain full custody of her son in another two years. But then came the pandemic, and Diane hasn't really got to know her son at all. There's nothing left for me to do. I mean, I'm as good as I'm going to get. I just want the opportunity to parent my kid. We have five other children in our care. Why can't they reunify him with us? And then there's Rachel a mother in Hobart. To this day, I still feel very strongly that they should never have removed my children. Rachel says she and her children were victims of domestic violence. She repeatedly called police, not realising that to help her kids, they'd be taken away. The intervention was needed, but at the end of the day, they break up a family, cause so much trauma. She found Erica at the Salvation Army's Doorway to Parenting Service and with her help got back three of her five kids. It's unclear what will become of her other two and Erica says it should never have happened. Definitely with that early intervention, with that su support prior to removal, I think she would have been able to keep her kids very safe and have a happy family. Our granddaughter is normally the happiest little girl you'll ever meet, as long as she feels safe. That's Margaret. She's a kinship carer in regional Victoria. She's also Abby's paternal grandmother. She loves to dance, she loves to sing, she loves her Barbies, she loves face paint and the water. Margaret first got a call asking if she'd look after Abby when Abby was just a month old. First it was weekends, then it was three nights a week, then it was five. Signs of abuse had begun to emerge, but still, Abby was returned to her mother. She would come home with human bite marks on her arms, scratches across her back. She once had a bruise from her belly button all the way to her hip. She had fingernail marks gouged into her nose. 
and there was an allegation of sexual violence against Abby too by her mother. Case workers report frequent burnout and high turnover. And this could be why. Nearly 300,000 children were at the centre of safety notifications made to Australia's various welfare departments between 2020 and 2021. Just over a third of them were investigated and nearly half of those were found to be legitimate child safety issues. Which means if nearly 200,000 weren't investigated, nearly 100,000 children were probably failed. Andrew is a children's caseworker in Western Australia. He starts at 7.30 in the morning and finishes at 6 at night. Two young girls that I know of over a period of two months talked about a family member of theirs who'd been inappropriately touching them. Given the staffing levels and the inability to be out there and the lack of resources to put around them, these children have been jumping up and down saying, hey, this is happening, this is happening. I imagine it would have felt like nobody was listening because they were still with this family member that had done this to them. I think it took three months for us to stop contact with the family member who was doing it. It's against the code of conduct for child protection workers to speak out. But the people in this story have because they're desperate, saying they don't get the resources or the funding to back up their goodwill and their genuine desire to help children in need. All departments were contacted and pointed to significant funding boosts and improved response times for child protective services in their states. What we would have said 10 years ago was the highest risk now becomes more of a yes, we'll do that in two or three days. It's a system that while it's in place to try and improve outcomes for children, like living in situations of adversity, it's actually causing a lot of further trauma and disadvantage. It's just, it's not working. My children's best interest is in their hands. 